Ein herzliches Willkommen, liebe Gäste, liebe Freunde des Museum Frieda Burda. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass wir heute Abend zu einer besonderen Veranstaltung zum Artist Talk, zum Künstlergespräch mit Margaret und Christine Wertheim, moderiert von Ingolf Bauer, hier einladen können. Wir haben uns bewusst entschieden, diese Veranstaltung nicht in einem Kongresshaus, in einem größeren Raum zu haben und dafür vielleicht 100 Karten mehr zu veräußern. Wir haben gesagt, das ist der richtige Ort, gerade zu Anfang. Hier ist die Inspiration, hier ist die Quelle von allem. Und deswegen wollten wir mit Ihnen heute in dieser besonderen Atmosphäre zusammenkommen. Ich weiß nicht, wie es Ihnen geht. Wenn Sie die Zeitungen aufschlagen, wenn Sie Online-Medien verfolgen, Sie hören von Klimawandel, Meeresverschmutzung, Ölpest vor dem Golf von Thailand, Vulkanausbrüche. Wenn Sie heute Morgen die Zeitung eine der größten deutschen Tageszeitungen gesehen haben, haben Sie was ganz anderes gesehen, nämlich eine Schlagzeile Baden, Baden häkelt sein Riff. Und nicht ein Riff in der Oos, nein, ein Riff hier im Museum Frieda Borda. Ich finde, das war eine ganz andere, eine wesentlich positivere Schlagzeile und dazu konnten wir beitragen. Ich denke, damit haben wir schon unglaublich viel geschafft und es war der Beginn einer Botschaft, einer Botschaft, die von dem Werk, von dem Werk von Christine und Margit Wertheim wirklich ausgehen wird. Und zeitgleich, am gestrigen Tag, als diese Ausstellung zum ersten Mal der Öffentlichkeit präsentiert wurde, haben Sie auch morgens gehört, die australische Regierung gab eine Million australische Dollar für die Rettung des Great Barrier Reefs. Also ganz so falsch können wir mit unserer Botschaft und mit dem Zeitpunkt, glaube ich, gar nicht gewesen sein. Das Great Barrier Reef ist auch genau die Naturschönheit, die der Ausgangspunkt war für das Denken, für das Leben und für das Lebenswerk von Christine und Margret Wertheim. Ich will nicht viel verraten, sie sind in Australien aufgewachsen, haben das Great Barrier Reef gesehen. Und äh, ihr Lebenswerk, was hier in dem Projekt Crotchet Coral Reef wirklich äh, zum Tragen kam, hatte dort seine Basis. Ein weiterer Ausgangspunkt war auch ein Häkelaufruf unter dem Claim Häkeln für die Weltmeere den wir im letzten Jahr im Juni gestartet haben. Wir haben nicht genau gewusst, was uns erwartete. Es war so ein bisschen wie die Büchse der Pandora, die wir geöffnet haben. Und es sind wirklich mehr als 40.000 Einsendungen, 40.000 Korallen hier zu uns gekommen. Und ich darf Ihnen wirklich versichern, wir haben jede Koralle registriert, katalogisiert, wir haben die Namen erfasst. Hinter jeder Koralle steckt eine Geschichte. Eine 93-jährige Dame, die gesagt hat, jetzt habe ich wieder Lebensmut, jetzt habe ich noch ein Vierteljahr, wo ich zehn Korallen Ihnen schicke. Die hat uns elf Korallen geschickt. Es sind wirklich Geschichten, berührende Geschichten und gehäkelt haben nicht nur Seniorenzentren, gehäkelt haben auch sehr viele Schulen, Schulgruppen und dabei auch einige männliche Schüler. Gehäkelt wurde nicht nur einzeln, sondern auch in Gruppen. Entstanden ist das, was Sie teilweise hier schon gesehen haben, was wir heute eröffnet haben, was wir bis zum Juni hier in Baden-Baden wirklich zeigen können. Ich glaube, auch da haben wir den Nerv der Zeit getroffen und wir würden uns sehr freuen, wenn wir hier auch wiederum einen Anstoß geben können, zum Nachdenken, Ausgangspunkt von der Schönheit, die uns vielleicht noch umgibt auf unserem Planeten und dass wir alle sensibilisiert werden sollen, alle dafür etwas beitragen sollten. Ich glaube, ein ganz, ganz wichtiges Ziel. Aber nun freue ich mich sehr, dass wir unter anderem auch da haben den künstlerischen Leiter unseres Hauses, den Kurator Ode Kittelmann, der hier vor mir sitzt, weil es war seine Idee, diese Ausstellung hier zu machen vor zwei Jahren. Ich bin ihm unendlich dankbar dafür, dass wir das hier realisieren konnten. Und ich freue mich auch sehr, dass Christine und Margret Wertheim spontan entschieden haben, sie verlängern ihren Aufenthalt im, wie wir wissen, schönen Baden-Baden und machen mit uns heute Abend ein Künstlergespräch. Insofern übergebe ich jetzt an Christine und Margret Wertheim und an Ingolf Bauer, Wissenschaftsjournalist und Physiker, der den heutigen Abend mit uns begleitet. Ich wünsche uns viel Vergnügen, viel Freude, aber auch viel Möglichkeit zum Nachdenken. Und bitte, Sie sind Multiplikatoren überall. Erzählen Sie es weiter und lassen Sie uns gemeinsam für eine vielleicht doch bessere Welt ein kleines bisschen tun, dann geht es uns allen besser. Herzlichen Dank und uns einen schönen Abend. Thank you very much, Henning Scharper. Thank you, Christine Wertheim. Thank you, Margaret Wertheim, for being here, for taking some time to give us an insight into your thoughts, into your background, into your ideas. And we have about an hour to talk about that. And you will, of course, get the possibility to uh, pose your questions towards the end of the talk. So we're really looking forward to this evening. What a pleasure to have you here. 
When I first entered the museum a few weeks ago, that was, um, well, the end of December, um, we, the, it wasn't already clear that 40,000 different coral pieces would arrive here, but there were already very many. I mean, to me, it looked like uh, after an explosion in a wool store. <laughs> Never seen that before, but I suppose <laughs> it must look like this. When you came here, Christine, in December, and you noticed, hey, this is really going somewhere. I mean, with all with the knowledge about limited time, about limited energy, knowing about the different projects you did before, what were your feelings? Um, uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for being here. Could, could I just apologize that we don't speak German? I feel it's very discourteous, but unfortunately, we don't. And so thank you all for listening in English. Um, I came in, as Ingolf said, I came in Octo the end of October, early November, to start the curation project. And at that time, we had 23,000 corals. And we know this because the museum has kept a spreadsheet of everybody's work. And so every everybody's individual corals are recorded, which is an astonishing feat for, for a museum to do. Um, as I said, there were 23,000 corals, and they were downstairs in what is supposed to be the museum's uh, meeting room, which was kindly donated to us to work in. And I just felt completely overwhelmed. I thought, we have curated before uh, with three to 5,000 corals, but this was already 23, and, and, and I knew they were going to be coming in for another six weeks, and I just yeah. felt this is an impossible task. I, I impossible. Really, I really felt it was, I just really felt completely overwhelmed. Um, it made you afraid? You couldn't? Yes, <laughs> I was terrified. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> it's, it's like, it really is, I felt like I've been asked to paint the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> <laughs> and I've only got, you know, two weeks. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, the museum was incredibly generous and provided resources yeah. so that, uh, uh, so that we, we put together a team of women who I then sort of gave very, very quick lesson in how to curate crochets, corals into crochet coral reefs. And, and the team of women who I'd like to name, uh, Tina Tina, Martina, Catherine, Susan, Charlotta, and Silka took to it like ducks to water. And by the time I'd left, we'd semi-curated three and a half reefs and, and I could leave them to themselves. And they were just brilliant. And you can see the results. It is a, a 16th chapel, isn't it, in a way? I mean, It is impressed. the Sistine Chapel of Crochet Coral Reefs, yes. Yeah. <laughs> 16 is also the number of years you've been dealing with these projects, right, Margaret? So, um, if you look, is that correct, from yes. 2005? So, if you yes. look back, you had mm -hmm. exhibitions, you had coral crochet reefs in different parts of the world, in Abu Dhabi, in Dublin, mm -hmm. on the coast of Germany, in London, of course, in the US, uh, in, in different places. If you look back over that time, how has the project actually changed? Well, I think uh, the biggest, the two, or the two biggest changes that have happened to the project is simply that over time, there have, in some of the projects, the numbers of people who've participated and the numbers of corals we've got has increased. So, when we did the Smithsonian in 2010, they had 4,000 corals. Then we did it in Helsinki and in Fur, and they each produced 5,000 corals, and now it's 40,000. So there's definitively been, it gets bigger and bigger. Not all reefs are bigger. There are, for instance, there are three reefs happening now, one in Canada and two in North America, which will be much smaller. So it's not all reefs get bigger. But the other thing that I think has happened over time that we really didn't expect is that this project operates a bit like the evolution of life on Earth. So everybody starts by learning the, the very simple algorithm for making a basic hyperbolic form, which looks like this. And it's a simple algorithm. You just keep increasing stitches and you get something that's very pretty and very regular looking and good for using in a mathematics classroom. 
in order to produce a coral reef, what you want is diversity. So you want to veer from the mathematically perfect formula and have a bit more frilly out here, a bit less there. You want to have stalks and, you know, spherical things and, you know, just go wonky all round, which is what nature does. And at several times during the course of the project, Christine and I thought we had seen uh, the end of new diversity. Oh. It, but it turns out that like nature, you know, there's no end of diversity of nature. You can get peacocks and giraffes and elephants and slime molds and, you know, nature has no end to its diversity. And, and viruses. And viruses, <laughs> constantly <laughs> creating new ones. And, and we think the crochet coral reef is like that now. There's endless diversity possible in the imaginative forms and the imaginative use of materials that people come up with. And this here in Baden-Baden, there have been quite a number of people who've come up with structures and shapes we've never seen before or variations on things that we've never seen before. So they all look different in the different parts of the world. That might reflect also mm. cultural differences or how do you, what, do you, what would you say? Is that the normal course of life with the different small changes in the DNA and you get the different, the, the huge diversity of shapes? Yeah, well, it, it, one way that we often think about the project is, as Margaret said, it, it is like evolution, uh, that the f diversity has developed over time through random mutation, through people just saying, okay, well, I'm going to try this or I'm going to try that, not because anybody's directed them to do anything. Um, and also because people, once someone develops something new, and then pages of uh, photos of it are available, then other people go, oh, I could do one of those, okay. but I could do a variation. So that's like so a cultural evolution. Yes. 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 But, but whether, whether the... So the, the reefs can be incredibly diverse, like really, really different. I mean, there's, there is no reef in the universe that looks like the Baden-Baden reef. It is absolutely unique. Mm -hmm. and, and ours are really quite different than the Baden-Baden reef. And the wall pieces are different. And the wall pieces are another evolutionary step that has taken place in Baden-Baden. Baden-Baden is like there's been a... Uh, not an extinction phase, but the opposite of an extinction like a phase. Like Cambrian explosion, Cambrian explosion, explosion of, of, new life. Form. of new forms. It really is like blown. It certainly blew my mind working with them. Um, I understand. But it, I don't know if it reflects the culture, or I don't know what it reflects. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe just time and the Maybe development just time. of the project. Yeah. Maybe you give us an idea of how you curate the pieces then, the reefs then. I mean, what we're seeing right here, those are the ones you brought from Los yes. Angeles. Yes. Those are the ones you curated um, mm. yourself with mm. certain collaborators, correct? Yes, they, they, they've all got some other people in them. Okay, but the, also already on the wall there, that's part of the Baden-Baden reef. So when you came here and you found these 25,000, then in the end 40,000, how do you... How do you proceed? What's your role in getting beautiful pieces and reefs like this? Well, the, the, the process of producing what I'm going to call our reefs, these ones, is fundamentally different from the process of producing the Baden-Baden reef because our ones have grown over 16 years. Each one of these originally was a tiny little mound on a basket, like literally this size covered in felt and then with corals attached to it and then we got bigger baskets and then we had bigger mounds and then we piled the baskets on top of the, each other so we had bigger mounds and then at that point the basket technique didn't work <laughs> so we had to start developing how to build an understructure that would hold a lot more corals up vertically. And, and that is also true of the horizontal reefs in, that look like aquariums. They've all grown over time. So all of our reefs, uh, as people, some people were saying to me last night, um, there was rumors that I had been adding to these reefs in, on site here, and I had added a lot. Um, so so these, these vertical ones that we call the crochet forest, um, they have all accumulated, particularly feelers, the, what, the sticky out bits, while I've been here. <laughs> <And> <laughs> meaning that we, Chrissy's been going around and taking 
choice things from the Baden, from the massive amounts of Baden, Baden corals and say, oh, we need a red thing for there or we need an orange thing. Oh, they've got lots. And they've had so much. It's sort of like... So they're alive. You could they're say. alive. <laughs> they can always go. And, and, and also I bought an entire suit. I bought one small suitcase of clothes, hence... The fact that Are I you wearing appear in corals or, underneath, maybe or no, <laughs> but I bought a huge suitcase of of new crochet pieces that I've made okay. to add to these. So my luggage was mainly crochet coral, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which is all now here. But curating the Baden Baden reefs, we haven't had 16 years. We had two and a half months. months. So it was a completely different process, and it was it. The thing that I can the thing that I can most compare it to is doing abstract expressionist painting. We had to curate basically on ta low tables like this so you could see them. And first of all, we uh, I had to draw mound structures that could be they're all they're all roughly four meters by two meters by one meter, which aren't the uh, cons I don't actually know Arndt's formal title, but he's the person who does all the museum installation and he and his team then built these mounds for us and then we had to, they're covered in fabric in the end. They're, they're quite complicated structures and then they have to be covered in corals and it, it's like you just have to start placing dobs of paint and you start, okay, well, sorry, there's one step I just missed out is the first thing I did when I came is they'd already sorted the colours into colour groupings like red and pink and purple. And, and they'd done that 10,000 times because people would say, that box doesn't look like red to me, that, those things are orange, not red. And people have really different sensibilities about what's red or pink or purple or orange. So they, they'd resorted and resorted the corals about 10 times before I arrived. And then I completely resorted them again and said, I want colour grouping. So the first grouping I chose was the neon grouping, which is the yeah. yellow, white and orange one. And then I chose what I call variegated, which is a kind of wall that varies. And then I decided we had to do what we collectively called the ugly reef, because I decided we had to deal with the corals I didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, the ugly reef in process became my favourite reef. <laughs> so it's not the ugly reef anymore. But so it, there is no plan behind it, obviously. No, there is, it's by intuition. It's never how a do you plan. Is there well, a principle the, the, the in the designing or is it, is it just by intuition? No, I mean, I think the, the, thing, the thing is you don't necessarily have a preconceived plan when you come because you don't know what you're going to confront. However, the very first thing, as Chrissy's trying to explain, is you have to very quickly make some kind of a plan. Mm. Like there is going to be an island, say, of red, white and blue, like there is upstairs. There is going to be an island of white and fluoro, yeah. orange. and So you, you're f confronted with this vast sea of corals and infinite possibilities are possible. So if, if we talk, you know, that lady in the audience, that man in the audience, and said, here is, here is your palette, you design something, they would do something completely different. So the, it's like doing a painting. You start off with a huge array of paint. You, anything is possible, but so you have to conceive of a plan and start executing yeah. it. Make a plan, make a second plan, both won't work. That's how yes. Bertolt Brecht put it. Now, yeah. what I find amazing is um, we look at these reefs and we say, sure, those are reefs. I mean, okay, it's written on the wall, <laughs> so we know <laughs> what we have to think. But still, if you compare it when you dive and you actually see a natural reef, it, it does not, not look like, like this. No, not at all. Not, not at, at all. all. No. This is not a documentary. I understand, but why do we still think this is a reef? Why do we associate it with that thought? Do you, do you want to answer that? Or? Well, we've done a lot of thinking about this because I've, I've d dived a few times and yes, nothing looks like this. <laughs> um, I think, well, we, we actually call this the coral forest. But I think to be, to, to be <laughs> technical about <laughs> it, it doesn't look like a forest either. <laughs> I, think, I think the reason why people accept it as a reef is because these frilly, curly shapes are very, very indicative of the 
they are the same kind of frilly, curly shapes as you find in reef organisms. Corals, kelps, nudie banks, sea slugs, sponges all make these shapes. And it's almost like it doesn't matter what you do, how artistically wild you get. If you use those shapes, people read it as a reef. But <coughs> I, I, I agree with Margaret, although it is also factually true that our first effort actually was a cactus garden because cactuses also have a lot of these shapes. And because I was working with green sparkly and pink fluffy wool, they ended up looking like cactuses. And so we could do, with these same kinds of shapes, you could do a cactus garden or a fungus, a fungus garden or a reef. But the other thing, reason I think they look like reefs to me is because even though they visually don't actually look like reefs apart from the frills, the processes by which they are made are almost identical to the reef process. That is to say, everything that we call a coral is made by millions, if not billions, of, of little micro polyps, and then th millions of those form together over large amounts of time to accrete and to make a reef sculpture garden under the water. And these are the same processes, thousands of people mainly women, have made <laughs> these individual corals and then thousands of labour hours went into constructing them over a large amount of time condensed into a very short duration. Um, so it the, reflects the process, process is the same. Mm. And, that, and, and I think it's that process as well as the, the hyperbolic a aspect that s indicates reefness. Where is the fish, by the way? <laughs> oh, we... we <laughs> People do like to make fish and <laughs> octopuses, octopuses and, but we, we learned very on that if you put representational animals in, it really breaks the illusion of the art and your mind doesn't know, is it in an art experience or is it in a um, documentary and it, it, it doesn't work on either level. So we we pretty quickly implemented what I used to refer to as the no starfish policy, which upset a few people, but it really does work. However, there are some people who have done amazing real, real life representations of animals, like there's two fabulous octopuses that are in, are in a little vitrine in the concept store downstairs, and they're truly remarkable. Is that too kitschy for you? Is that kitsch? If it turns into this representational it, style, a bit too Disney, you could say. It does. It does. It does yeah. tend to. It does tend to look kitsch, because and it just looks. It just looks like, as you say, like bad Disney animation, because your brain doesn't know whether it's it's trying to receive something as art, or as some sort of narrative, mm. or as some sort of, you know, pseudo documentary. And it's it's very interesting how little things like that actually really do make a big difference. I mean, I'll tell you another opposite thing on that, which is very interesting. If you look at the little reefs we have downstairs in the vitrines here, or the big vitrines we have upstairs, they've got sand on the bottom. So I I do the I put all the things in, I range it. And then I pour the sand on the bottom. And it's remarkable how as soon as you put the sand in, how much natural, naturalism it adds to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's like immediately your mind says, wow, that really does look like a reef. It's, it's interesting. Thus, these tiny little cues to your mind about nature are really very powerful. But then you have to know the limit before the mm -hmm. sand Sandy, the beachy part turns into Disney Ye land. Yes, and okay. and and also that is a matter of personal opinion because there are many people who <laughs> loathe the entire project because they think it, even without knitted sea creatures, yeah. it's already hyper kitsch. Like a lot of people don't just simply don't like it. Not well, some people don't. Lots of people love it. Lots of people love it, but there are people who there don't people like do. it at all. <laughs> And what do they say? They say it's kitsch, or what's they, the they, they just exhibit no interest in it at all. Then you know you can tell from their lack of interest that that, that they dislike it. Is it the crochet? Is it the material? Or do you really want me to answer that question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you? Raise that? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I opened that door. <laughs> My personal opinion is that, as you said, 
when you walked into the meeting room, it was like an explosion in a jumper factory. And to some people, the, the curated reefs are like an explosion in a, in a jumper factory with uh, female hormones impregnated in every fibre of every one of them. And they do not like that experience. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe we'll leave that field for a minute and uh, <coughs> try to get to know the two of you a bit better. You come from Queensland. They come from Queensland, Brisbane, on the eastern coast of um, mm -hmm. Australia. It's right, um, well, you could say outside of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, Margaret um, started her career as a physicist and a mathematician. She, that's what she studied. She became a science writer. Um, she wrote for the New York Times. She did documentaries. She was obviously in all kinds of places on this earth. Um, she wrote several books on the cultural story of physics, you could say. And uh, how, how st if you look back now to, to Brisbane and your youth, I know we shouldn't <laughs> kind of exaggerate the personal part that you told me, but how, how strong is that memory and how strong did that, um, yeah, how could you call it, um, make you the person that you are today, that you live close to this great barrier reef? Well, um We, we lived in Brisbane, which is the capital of the state of Queensland, which is where the Great Barrier Reef is. And it's, a, it's about, still about a thousand miles away from where the Barrier Reef starts. So actually, when we lived in Brisbane, neither of us went anywhere near the Great Barrier Reef because it's a long way away and quite expensive to get there. It is certainly true that all Queenslanders, indeed all Australians, whether they've been to the Barrier Reef or not, are very conscious that it's it's one of the world's great natural wonders and it's on our watch and it's getting heard. So when we were growing up, coral bleaching hadn't really started yet, but we, the Barrier Reef was getting these infestations of these these horrible starfish, these crown of thorns starfish, which which were like a plague and they would they would really do great damage to the Barrier Reef. So we were, un we were aware that the Great Barrier Reef was an ecologically fragile and very important place. Um, but growing up in... The thing for us about growing up, or for me anyway, about growing up in Brisbane is we grew up... Um, Brisbane was a small country, a large country town then, and we, we lived basically on the outskirts of it, so it was kind of like growing up in what we call Australia in the bush. And it was very much like um, very kind of free childhood. We had, you know, we were just running around bare feet in the bush with snakes and spiders. And, um, and I think that that kind of experience was very powerful for our, for, at least for my formation as a child. And our parents, particularly our mother, very much encouraged an interest that I had very early on in maths and science. And so, you know, she was had all of these wonderful mathematical type of play toys, like building blocks and puzzle shape making things. Can, and can I just and she this? really wanted us to, you know, have the experience of exploring stuff for ourselves. And I think that was really critical. Okay. And the handicraft part, was that also from your parents, probably? From our mother, yeah. Well, well I'd, I'd just like to add something to what Margaret said. Um, we, we grew up, Brisbane, when we grew up, is to use one of our favourite English words, was very feral. Do you know that word? No. It, it means, well, a feral animal is an animal that was domesticated and then went wild. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, it, Brisbane was very feral when we grew up. According to some histories, Brisbane invented punk. Mm -hmm. um, so it was the bush and punk. Um, it was very <laughs> not like, for instance, Baden Baden, <laughs> our childhood. It was bare feet and snakes and punk rock. Yeah, we um, suffer from that. <laughs> sorry, oh, you have that too. Yes, we have that. Germans and Australians have that in common. Um, but uh, as Margaret said, our mother did encourage us to do handicrafts. More than that, uh, she had, before she got married and had children, had trained to be a teacher of physical education. Mm -hmm. And in her training as a teacher, 
she had learned about a system of education called kindergarten, which was a formal system of education invented by the Germans in the late 19th century, which had in fact spread all around the world and made it to Australia and it, in the late 60s when we were going to school, there were still elements of the kindergarten system in the Australian education right. system. So I believe that our, or at least for my, I didn't know this at the time, but as an adult, and now we know about the history of kindergarten, uh, I believe that our childhood was also very influenced by, by this kindergarten formation, even though we only had a tiny bit of it. Okay. I think for me, it gave me a love of form and shape and playing with form and shape in a way that I really do identify now that I understand it with that education system and I wish it would come back again. Form and shape that led you into a completely, well, we could say it's a different field. Um, you have your PhD in literature and philosophy. Mm. Right. She was, um, Christine was in London then for a long time. She taught there for 20 years, I think, at different art schools. In the end, uh, she went to California, taught at the California Institute of Arts or for mm -hmm. Arts. And that's where the two of you, more or less like in a loop of uh, living, <laughs> came back together. Is that inevitable <laughs> as twins to come that your paths kind of come together again at some point? Apparently. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if it is inevitable. We, we actually have a lot of friends who are twins and so we are always fascinated how other twins deal with twindom. It's a very unique relationship and it, I always say that being a twin is like being married since the moment of conception with very little option for divorce, <laughs> that you have to try to negotiate with each other your whole life and it is a lot of... Twindom can be great and you share incredibly deep bonds, but like all great relationships it also requires a lot of work and because Christine and I come from very different fields her from the arts and me from sciences we do a lot of talking and thinking together about what it means to bring different things together from our different lives and sometimes because of our different educational backgrounds her in the humanities and art schools and me in the science fields sometimes we we just have very very different ways of seeing things And so that's always interesting discussions. I mean, you could think that the natural sciences with physics and mathematics is a way, of course, of trying to find out about the deep truths of the world. And so is art, in a way, also trying to find out what's behind things, you know, get to the truth of the things. So you could say you both, since you reflect these both sides of um, education, um, a lot comes together. I don't know if that makes life easier or <laughs> if it makes life harder. What do you think? Um, uh, unfortunately, I've studied philosophy seriously. And so the question of what is truth is something that's possibly not the appropriate occasion to go into. But uh, what I will say is that When we were at school, although the education system was generally extremely poor, for reasons that have, have always remained a mystery to me, the mathematics education was very good. So, like Margaret, until we finished high school, I always believed I would go into maths as, and science as well. But when we finished high school, I, re, I, re, I thought that we needed to separate. I mean, we, we don't look alike anymore, but we did when we were young. And people treated us as, as if we were the same person. And I thought that we had to separate our lives. And so I realized that Margaret loved maths and physics more than I did. Mm. So I had to find something else to do. And it actually, I went through quite a lot of different careers. <laughs> <laughs> but they were all in the arts. Initially. Yes, but anyway. And the punk career, I suppose, right? Well, we, we, <laughs> we were both in the punk Australian punk scene, yes. <laughs> okay. We weren't actually in punk bands. We just had lots of friends and hung out, hung out in that world a lot. If we continue, finding <laughs> you both in Los Angeles there, and uh, you founded an institute for figuring. 
which obviously brings together a few of the ideas you just mentioned of mathematics, of aesthetics, of geometry, of explaining science. And I would like you, Margaret, to just give us an idea of um, what's behind that Institute for Figuring. What is that? Well, the, the idea for this institute was really, it came out of the fact that I had been a science writer and science journalist for, by that stage, over 20 years. And I became very aware and very conscious that science magazines and science TV programs and science radio programs w had really quite, at least in the English-speaking world, I don't know what it's like in Germany, had quite limited audiences that they tend to, the overwhelming statistics when you looked into it were that the audience was white male older and well educated and in upper socioeconomic brackets and the reason i knew this was i ran around to all the magazines and i gathered the statistics which they keep for their advertisers and i'd intuitively thought this was true but when i saw the statistics i was really shocked and i thought look that we have to be able to be more diverse in our communication about science. There has to be ways to communicate about science and mathematics and computation and the more technical fields of science to people who are never going to be subscribers to New Scientist or Scientific American. So I wanted a way of having events that would engage people with science in a much more, well, in ways that were appealing to a different kind of people. Most of my friends, particularly, who were in the arts and the humanities. And so what I started to do was to put on lectures and workshops with scientists and mathematicians. And what would happen is that I would work with the scientist or mathematician to craft a lecture that they would give around their work, but that would be suitable for the audience mm. and who, who are, you know, not university trained or anything. But also the, the commitment was that every event would have a hands-on dimension. So if we, for instance, were talking about not theory, which is a part of mathematics topology, we would actually make knots and do some little exercise to physically make them and understand them or we had people come and do say lectures on mathematical origami and then we would all fold something or we and so do things out we did we did lecture on fractals and we all made fractals out of business cards so it was kind of like what christine said it, it was we saw this institute as in the tradition of this kindergarten system of education, which was developed by the great German pedagogue Friedrich Froebel, who some of you will no doubt know of. Who Freiber, yeah. Friedrich Froebel. You, Freiber. Yeah, and so Froebel is our hero, and he was the kind of model of we want to do Froebelian kindergarten for grown-ups. And Froebel had an interesting philosophy. He believed that the smallest children should be introduced to the most abstract ideas, The uh, most general, the most general, general ideas. So Freudian education was all about you start with very abstract geometric ideas, playing with blocks and shapes and weaving little sticks, etc. And only at the end of your Freudian education, after four or five years of it, would you be given the opportunity to do something representational, like make a little clay model of a mm. horse or a flower. Mm. And 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 so we had this belief too that we could introduce people to really abstract ideas like Freud would did through physically playing with concepts. And what we see here, the Crochet Coral Reef project is has, uh, so to say, ignited or started at the Institute for Figuring too, right? Mm -hmm. And behind yeah. it is the idea of hyperbolic geometry. And mm -hmm. since you explained how well you do that in your Institute <laughs> for Figuring, we already put up this chalkboard right yeah. there. And uh, if you could uh, do us that favor and give us a hint, what is a hyperbolic geometry? What's so special about these corals, either in the natural yes. world or in the crochet world? Sure. Well, the hyperbolic structures which we see in the corals, the crochet corals, are exactly the same hyperbolic structures that you see in the living corals. So, yeah. But I'll just spend a few a couple of minutes so mostly when people learn geometry we pretty much all learn 
what's called Euclidean geometry, which is the geometry of a flat plane. And we all know, you know, that's what we all learn at school. And we pretty much taught that Euclidean geometry is the way the world is. Um, so, for, for instance, on Euclidean geometry, the angles of a triangle all add up to 180. And we're told that, you know, that's what a triangle is. It's the shape that adds up, the angles add up to 180. We know that in Euclidean geometry on the surface, you know, on, on a flat plane, a circle, the dis, the, if I call that the radius, the circumference of the circle going around here is 2 pi by r. And we're told that's what a circle is. But these shapes are, um, th this is just a property of a surface which is flat everywhere. So this is a property of a piece of paper that just goes on forever and ever. But you're all actually familiar with another kind of geometry, which actually is just as important to geometry. Guess. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Have it. So... Does anyone want to guess what the other geometry is that you already know pretty well? You do all know it. <laughs> think about the world around you and think what <laughs> other s structure you encounter. Uh, it's the surface of the earth. So if you think about the earth, it's a sphere. So what we have, and so obviously this is a different surface. Just I just want you to think about this as as a um, yeah. hollow object. So like think of a beach ball. So it's got a skin that's spherical, and inside there's nothing. So we're just talking about a surface. So th this is what we call a spherical surface. As the, the other one's called a Euclidean surface, this is a spherical surface. So. On, on the surface of a sphere, and so we're going to think about what we know about the equator of the Earth, and we have lines of longitude going through it, and I'm going to do another line of longitude. Oh. You so, you, you know, you, you're all pretty familiar with the surface of a sphere. You know, if you travel around and it, you come back to your the place where you start, you know, it always has, you know, you, can, you never get away, for, you can never go out to infinity. So if you look at the surface of a sphere and we draw a triangle on the surface of a sphere. Pick and another colour. Oh. I don't know if it, and, if we look at the angles, those two angles there will be 90 degrees and you will have some other angle up here. So that means we've got 90 plus 90 plus whatever this angle is here, alpha. So that means that on the surface of a sphere, the angles of a triangle always equal more than 180. Now, and it also happens that if I take, if I draw a circle on the surface of a sphere, it's the circumference of the circle will be not 2 pi r, but you just have to take my word for it, it's less than 2 pi r. So now we have, we see that different okay, surfaces, like this is a curved surface. <laughs> is this too much? No. We're, we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're all very curious to get to that I, hyperbolic I, I, geometry. I, 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 could it, I could do this much quicker myself. <laughs> <laughs> you do it with so fingers, Molly. The, 
the other option that we have is a hyperbolic surface. I mean, you have to understand the others to understand what a hyperbolic, because... I don't think anybody expected to do a whole mathematics uh, studies oh. in here okay. within a few minutes. Well, so. <laughs> unfortunately with math, you usually have to spend a little bit of time if you actually want to understand. On a hyperbolic surface, <laughs> the angles of a triangle actually add up to less than 180 degrees. This is a hyperbolic surface. It's like the edge of a lettuce. It, it, instead, of the, the, instead of the sphere, cur the surface curving into itself, at every point it curves away from itself, so it gets bigger and bigger. So that's why you get this kind of frilly, lettuce-y shape, because, it, see, that, that's the first line there. Is that long? And then the last line is this long, so you're getting more. The surface is getting longer. And that is something very special in, in the mathematical world, mm. isn't it? A hyperbolic geometry. Well, what, what we know in, from these three surfaces is that there are, there are in mathematics surfaces with fundamentally different properties on them. So you have the flat one, which is the Euclidean surface, the spherical one, which curves towards itself. Mathematicians call it positive curvature. And the other one, as Chrissy said, this hyperbolic surface curls away from itself, and mathematicians call it a negatively curvature surface. And one way to think about it is it's the geometric equivalent of negative numbers. So just like you have zero positive numbers and negative numbers, you have zero curvature, positive curvature, and negative curvature. Do the, do the corals know about hyperbolic geometry forming these wonderful shapes? Well, I would like to claim that they do. So the, the coral, so here's an interesting story. Human mathematicians spent 2,000 years trying to prove that something like this was impossible. And it was only in the early 19th century that they realized actually it is possible. Yeah. And what's strange about it is that they had been seeing hyperbolic things all around them. Um, I once asked the mathematicians, why couldn't some mathematicians, why couldn't they see them? Uh, and, and they said, well, there probably weren't a lot of mathematicians, you know, scuba diving. Scuba, <laughs> scuba diving. But but there were plenty of mathematicians having green leafy vegetables for their lunch, you know, lettuces and kales that were pretty common in Europe, and also the edges of many flower petals, uh, petals, you know, roses and yeah. carnations and lots of flowers with those curly. So it raises an interesting question. What does it mean to know mathematics? What does it mean to know this particular mathematics? And I would like to make the claim that the corals and the kelps and the cactuses and the lettuce leaves who have been doing this and making these um, forms in the fibers of their beings, that they do, in fact, understand hyperbolic geometry. It's a, a form of embodied understanding and embodied knowing but I would like to claim that it's just as legitimate a form as knowing. Now, they're not going to be able to write equations and pass university tests, but is that really what knowing means? Maybe, yeah. Mm. Um, if you teach that also to the participants uh, crocheting these coral reefs, um, what kind of empowerment is it for them? I mean, they do they need to understand what hyperbolic geometry means in the end? Or is it, like you said, just that they have the, well, the ability to form it and they embody it in a way too? Or what kind of empowerment is that if you know Can about I hyperbolic answer? geometry? Can I answer this? Um, my view about that, come, you know, speaking as a person who has not had a university education in mathematics, speaking as a person who learned hyperbolic geometry through doing hyperbolic crochet, it is extremely empowering, particularly to women who crochet and who do a lot of hand, feminine handicraft. It is extremely empowering in their sense of what they themselves are doing to understand that what you're doing is validated by scientists and mathematicians because scientists and mathematicians in our world are often seen as 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 the apotheosis of understanding and knowing and knowledge and it's my experience that a lot of handicrafters 
don't feel that their craft is much regarded by other people and to understand that I can do crochet that has mathematical properties gives it a status that it didn't have before. Now that doesn't mean that it changes your creative capacities because it doesn't, mm. but it, the, the, the validation that apparently comes with this is very significant to people who make, or, or it can be. Mm. There's another dimension of this too. Um, I'm the one who's done uh, a lot of workshops around the world with different satellite reefs. And when I give a workshop to teach people hyperbolic crochet at the beginning of the process, I always begin with a like a half hour little mini lecture on the history of geometry and what all of the different bran three branches of geometry are. And then we end up talking about how this hyperbolic geometry led to the kind of geometry that underlies general relativity in the structure of the universe. And universally women say to me, this is incredibly empowering to them that while they are doing a feminine handicraft, they're also being given access to sophisticated ideas that ultimately do relate to things like the structure of the cosmos and that they feel this delights them because a lot of them say, look, when I was a kid, I thought I liked mathematics and thought I was good at it. But some teacher said, oh, no, no, you know, girls don't do maths or whatever. And so many of them have that experience that now to be given the opportunity to understand this kind of sophisticated mathematics and to do it within the context of a workshop about a, fem a handicraft, which they find pleasurable, they find it's incredibly empowering to them to be given, to, to be actually told, look, you can understand this stuff. That is maybe a part of the feminist aspect of your work too. What I find uh, interesting is that it's always a, a collective piece of art what you expose here. So obviously this thought of very many people working together seems very important to you. And what, what it ends up with is that very creative people who would never have a chance to actually end up in a museum like Frida Boda, end up here with their creativity and have their pieces exposed here up on the wall. Is there a, like a subversive aspect maybe to this idea? Um, th this is another one of the elements that we didn't plan on. It kind of just happened um, as we've already had one little micro lecture, I won't do another one, but um, it, it happened in stages that we got more and more, we got some participants, then we got more participants, then we got more participants, and now we've got 40,000 participants, 4,000 participants. Um, we, we truly didn't expect that, but given that it's happened, we embraced it. We made a decision very early on to embrace this and have our reefs shown next to the people's reefs and to have all the people credited on the walls. And we didn't need to do that. We could have said, no, it's our work. And even though you actually made it, you're not going to get any credit because that's the way the art world basically operates. Other people are the artists and other people build the work and you don't have any idea who they are. But we decided not to do that. Um, and Yes, I think it's a very important aspect of the project. And Is that a critics of the art world as it is now? I, I wouldn't call it a, a, a critique of the art world. It's just, it's, it's an addition. It's the, the art world, as I understand it, as a, as a teacher teaching in an art school, um, is very much built around the idea of individual creativity or possibly a duo two people working together, or at the very limit, a collective of, say, four or five. Um, but predominantly, the art world revolves around the creations of individuals, even if they're not actually created by individuals, but only one individual is named. And I, don't th I believe that collective making and creativity is, can produce just as fabulous results and is just as significant and I'd like to see more of it. Mm.
Um, I think it produces the collectivity here. Uh, as I was saying earlier to you, we've done. People always ask how much time does it take, and we, we we've never sat down and done the sums because we never knew how many corals we had. But given that we do know how many corals we had here, and given that we do know how much time was spent in the curation, I've calculated that something like 200,000 labour hours is embodied in the Barden Barden reefs. At least. At least. Which, which, if you talk about a working week being 40 hours a week, and a working year being 50 hours, 50 weeks a year, and a working life being 60 years of life, that turns out to be something like two and a half lifetimes of people. People labour. And it's a real, it's a, a hand labour. It's hand a handicraft labour. Mm -hmm. I mean, our world is actually made up mostly of uh, people making the big money in the elite positions. Those are the ones working with their brains. Now, if we look at coral reefs, natural coral reefs, the, the polyps, they don't even have brains right. and <laughs> make these wonderful, huge <laughs> reefs. Do, do, could, could we read your um, crochet reefs as also as a statement, maybe against this dominance of brain work in our world? Yes, absolutely. Um, there are many th theories now of what is called the new materialism, as opposed to the old materialism, which was Marxism, or at least for some people. But the new materialism uh, spreads across pretty much all uh, disciplines now. And, and, and it's the idea that for, t roughly, roughly speaking, at least 2,000 years in the Western world, there has been a, an idea that what matters is not matter, but the form, the idea, the shape, the concept. And the new materialism is saying, no, the matter matters, which is a beautiful phrase in English and unfortunately possibly doesn't work in German, <laughs> but that, that matter really matters and matter and materiality contribute to what I'm going to call knowledge <laughs> or as much as the idea and the form. And this, for the Western world, is apparently a radical concept. I don't believe it's a radical concept in other cultures, but it is for the Western world, which I'm, for the purpose of this, going to define as the inheritance of the Greco-Roman plus Judaic elements. A meta world, a material world also. I mean, you were at invited to the um, Venice Biennale in... 2019, and I mean, with this, you more or less reached the top of the top of the art world. Um, it would have been easy, probably, for you to afterwards say, okay, we will curate single reefs, we will have them, we'll make certain pieces ourselves, we'll have others do pieces for us, and we can sell those. You don't do that. <laughs> no. Why no. not? <laughs> We've never had any offers. <laughs> oh, serious? <laughs> well, the, 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 problem, the, the problem is that if you want to sell work for gallerists and dealers, you, you have to be able to produce a lot of them. They have to know that there's a pipeline of them. And it's very difficult to get a pipeline of these that are genuinely community-made. So... If we wanted to, say, do what a lot of artists do and say, okay, we're just going to design the forms and we're going to hire a village of workers in India or South Africa and they're going to churn out the forms. And there are plenty of artists who do that and I don't you know, have anything against it. But that would be a completely different project than what this is, which is actually getting working with the individual people and, and with communities who we have direct contact with. So the, the very, I think the very special nature of these sculptures, whether it's the ones that we do with uh, a few dozen of people we know closely helping us, or the ones upstairs with thousands, they have been done as collective collaborative works, as opposed to, is, but, but that makes it very hard to sell because it raises all these questions. Who owns it? Who owns what bits of it? What would you do if you sold it? Um, so the only way to make it, as it were, a saleable item and be able to churn out enough of them to actually keep an art market in it going would be 
to tr completely change the nature of the project and we just design and farm out the the, const the construction or the, the, the piecing of it. And, and that would just, it would be a completely different project. Mm. I mean, then, then, then we'd just be, uh, we, we, we would be business people, mm -hmm. um, which is not what we wanted to do. And put it this way, if I was going to go into a business farming out my ideas and for other people to embody with their labour, it probably wouldn't be coral reefs. <laughs> It'd probably be something possibly more profitable, <laughs> like sneakers or... <laughs> we've, spoken, we've spoken about very many different aspects of your work already, from feminism, handicraft, collective work. What we did not touch so far is the environmental aspect. And that's what actually catches our eyes. And that's what Henning Schaper in the beginning, you, I hope your German will be better next time when you <laughs> arrive. But what he, of course, mentioned in the beginning too. Can we read your pieces as a, a way of um, waking us up and saying, hey, people, look at this world. We've almost made it collapse. Um, better wake up. Well, I think uh, in, in that sense, I see the Reef Project very much in, as an extension of the work that I was doing before this, which was being a science journalist. And I think good journalism plays a very, very inf important role in our society to bring to keep people's attention ideas that are often not getting attention. And to keeping them in front of the audience when you know perhaps people are you know not wanting to you know embrace them or not wanting to pay enough attention and it seems to me in this sense good good art about issues can play the same function as good journalism about issues as you say um, in Mr. Ingold it keeps it keeps it says reminds people of the beauty of these reefs that are dying out. And in fact, the night that Christine and I started the project, Christine joked that if the Great Barrier Reef ever died out, there would be, you know, our woolly ones could be something to remember it by. And that was literally a joke. But now, 15, 16 years later, scientists have been saying the Great Barrier Reef really could die out in the next few years, the next few decades. And so, you know, the ghastly idea that there might just be this to remember it by is now a real possibility. Mm. And I think as global warming gets ever worse and ever more urgent, then I think the work becomes ever more relevant to alert people. The question then is, does it change anybody's practice? And that is... The, that is something we we can't possibly know whether it has that effect on our audience, just like journalists don't know if it has that effect on them. But one hopes that the, that the constant remindering will eventually accumulate into people going, oh, well, I really do have to think and change my behaviour. But could, could I just add something to that? Um, I, I, I think, at, at least in my perception that one of the reasons we've got the problem of global warming is because collectively as a species, and this particularly comes from the West even if it's now spread everywhere else, we have developed a society which is very focused on individuality, not collectivity mm. and communality. And I personally believe that we will not avoid global warming and human catastrophe unless we change our ways, unless we learn to be more collective, both with each other and with other species that live on this planet and with the planet itself. And this project is a demonstration that collectivity is possible. Give me, give me one hint about what's going to happen to the coral reefs that have been produced or created as satellite reefs. What is happening? Those we're seeing here will be taken back to Los California, Angeles. I suppose, or then to the next museum. Yes, I mean, we, we house owls. They all have crates and they 
live in art storage between exhibitions, so we are committed to their storage and preservation. Um, unfortunately, with most of the satellite reefs that have happened, um, they haven't been preserved. They've just been allowed to disintegrate or you know disbanded in some way. Very, very few of them have actually been kept. And that's because community-based art is not necessarily seen as something that institutions want to put resources into storing and preserving, which after all is very, very expensive to do. But couldn't that be part of your concept already? I mean, it's such a strong. We don't have the symbol. resources. You don't have the resources. Oh, we don't. We don't even we come close to having the resources. We can to barely. Be we can to barely afford to store. Art storage is phenomenally expensive. We, uh, art storage facilities. If any, if, if you, any of you ever get the chance, they're fascinating places, but they're very expensive places, and we can barely afford to store our own. But that <laughs> means those wonderful. Um, satellite reefs, reefs done by so many participants are going to join the fate of the natural reefs too, disappearing? That, we, that, that that's has a bad been, symbol. We don't know. That, that has, well, well that, we don't know. But, well, we don't know in this case, but there have been um, 50 satellite reefs made at this point, and I think only two or three of them have been kept. Mm. We, it is our very, very great wish that the masterpiece of the Baden-Baden Satellite Reef, which, as Chrissy said, we think is the Sistine Chapel of reefs, should be kept. But it's not something we have the resources to do. We really, we really would like that to happen. Let's keep these reefs alive. I would <laughs> like to give you a chance <laughs> to ask your questions too to Christine and Margaret Wertheim. Who's going to start, right? That was the first finger I saw. Right here, the microphone is approaching you. Uh, yes, to, to build on. We to can build on what you just said. Who is owning them? To whose, whose property are these? The uh, corals, which we see here. Is it your pro are you owning it? Is it your property, which has been made by thousands of people? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> no, no, wait, I should explain. So the ones that you are seeing, everything that you are seeing on the ground floor, except the freeze, everything else on the ground floor belongs to us. We, 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 care, we have built these and we care for them and store them and pay for the, all the conservation, etc. What And everything on the mezzanine floor in the, with the other vitrine works. The ones on the top floor that were made by the thousands of ladies of Baden-Baden and these long freezes and the big one out the front that were also made by the people of Baden-Baden, that belongs to M Museum Frieda Berda. So there is a chance for them to stay alive. Where is the next question coming from? Could, could I make a comment I wanted on the issue of collectivity that I wanted to that I think is really interesting. That, um, so uh, art, art in general is seen as something that's made by an individual. So it has the name Leonardo da Vinci or Olaf R. Eliasson or Jeff Koons. But in the world of science now, almost all science is done by huge teams of people. Mm. So you say you take the discovery of the Higgs boson. Three people won the Nobel Prize for that, but it is estimated that up that 10,000 people, engineers, scientists, computer programmers, etc., participated in making that discovery possible. And in science now, it is seen that basically Cutting edge science now is done by the work of teams, usually very, very large teams, and that is the nature of science today. And in that sense, our project is, operates more like a science project than what is usually thought of as an art project. We're still the fundamental mythos, if you want to call it, of art creation is still an individual doing something by themselves. That used to be true. It, science could possibly be thought of that 
in the 17th century. In the 21st century, it certainly can't be. Just remembering how you put emphasis on the fact that the making of the corals is the essential thing, the process, the mm -hmm. getting in touch with the wool and making, the producing itself. Could we read it as if um, the reefs upstairs were actually just a, a byproduct and it's not so important in the end? <laughs> Some people do have that um, do have that perspective. In fact, it has been said to us by uh, institutions who've commissioned shows and done satellite reefs. It is, when we have raised the issue of could Keeping these be them. preserved, they have said to us, "Oh, it's the process that matters." The end the actual sculptures, if you're going to call them sculptures, is just a byproduct. It doesn't really matter if they disappear, but unfortunately it matters to Margaret and I. <laughs> <laughs> we actually care about them. We'd actually like them not to disappear, but we don't have the resources okay. to preserve them. Too <laughs> beautiful to disappear do. in any case. Sorry? Too beautiful to disappear. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're, we love them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, here yeah, fauna. <laughs> Thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. What came to my mind was the following. Um, I think the, this Baden-Baden coral reef must have had an impact on your own work. And I, would, I was wondering in what way does it influence perhaps your own work <laughs> and how do you see your own work in this collective art work? Thank you. Do you want to answer that? Yes. Yeah. Um, you want to uh, as Margaret said earlier, the Baden-Baden Reef has produced like a Cambrian explosion in the evolution of the project. To such a and it has produced it to such a degree that I don't think we could ever compete with it. So <laughs> we don't want to compete with it. It is the masterpiece of crochet coral reefs, and I I don't know what the consequences of that is because I've only just digested it to be confronted with the Sistine Chapel of your own work and realise that other people did it. <laughs> I don't know what effect that's going to have on me yet. But I feel very proud to have participated in it. I, I really do. Um, but I don't know what effect it will have on the rest of my life, except that I feel proud of it. But the evolution is going on. The evolution is continuing. The yes. evolution is continuing, but maybe not in our hands. Maybe maybe somebody else is God it now. <laughs> well, it's like, you know, one way to think about it is you, you raise a child and one day the child does things that are so extraordinary you couldn't have imagined that something that you raised could have exceeded your... I mean, I'm sure a lot of parents have this feeling, we, neither of us have children, but that you have raised a child and it's ultimately done something that's so extraordinary that you couldn't have imagined how great it could be and you feel immensely proud that it has, it has had this life of its own that so exceeded your wildest imaginations about what was possible. And, and the Baden-Baden Reef does. It, Christy and I always had this dream that if we had infinite resources, something like that was possible. But we never imagined actually having access to infinite resources. And in, its, in, this, in this case, it feels like we have had infinite resources. And it has produced something that is the apotheosis of this dream that we had that we never re imagined could actually come into being on such magnificent materials in substantiality. So I guess your question is, what do you do after your dreams come true? <laughs> I don't know. It's only just happened to me. 
And I'd like to thank the Museum Frieda Berda and Udo Kittleman for this opportunity to make our dream come true. They deserve, they, I could never have imagined such generosity from an institution. Truly, it's extraordinary. It really is extraordinary. I don't think many institutions would do it. Sorry. I do actually feel genuinely tearful. Oh, it's mine. Sorry. Are there Got any more questions floor. or comments on what you've heard in our discussion? You can also ask your questions in German and we'll translate, no problem. No? Okay. Really? Nobody got a question? <laughs> a little question? <laughs> don't be shy. We, were, we don't bite. <laughs> Did any of you participate? Na, die geht bis Ende Juni. Das, das ist alles unklar, glaube ich. Also so, nicht als diese Ausstellung wird sie garantiert nicht weitergehen. Und die Elemente gehen ja zurück nach Kalifornien. Are you positive about the future in this world? Sorry? With all the ecological problems. I oh. mean, this is what this associates no, to. No, I'm, I'm not positive at all. No? In, 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 in fact, if you want my real opinion, I, I think, I think humanity is going to do extraordinary damage to itself before it collectively changes its ways. And I think it that's needs a, great a catastrophe. Shame because the planet will survive. The planet's billions of years old. If you go out to the center of Australia, you can feel the billions of years because in Australia, it was the first land mass above water and there used to be a mountain range as big as the Himalayas. And now it's all worn down flat and there's just these few standing rocks, which are literally the backbones of a mountain range. And it took billions of years for that process to happen. And when you're out in the center of Australia, you feel billions of years around you. I have no worries about the planet. We're nothing. We're just little newts, little ants that will make it sick for a few million years and then we'll be gone and so will the whales and the maybe the corals, although corals are billions of years old too, they'll probably come back and, and you know, there'll be new life forms. It's just we won't be here and I feel sad. I actually like humanity. <laughs> but um, I don't have much hope myself. Isn't it a, a, a evidence that if we all work together and kind of forget about the techno stuff, that we can really make a difference and a change? I h hope that this project makes some small contribution mm. to that to that plan. I don't know though. Mm. It would be nice to think it did, but I don't know. I won't be here in a hundred years. Wish I could. Wish I could come back. <laughs> like to see. <laughs> that's the course of life. <laughs> and I guess that's the course of discussions that you'll reach a point when it's just over. <laughs> <laughs> just over. <laughs> and the thoughts will be taken home and will circle in our heads. And uh, we will think back to this evening, I think, quite a lot. Uh, and I thank you very much, Christine Wertheim and Margaret Wertheim. Thank you for joining and um, yeah, letting us know about what you think and how you work and how you proceed and what this is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you. It was fascinating. <laughs>